Today's uh, brown bag is going to be led by Pete Calcagno. Uh, he's going to be looking at uh, PAC money and campaign contributions. The paper I want to uh, discuss today, the topic um, really comes from a paper that uh, I worked on with um, Professor Jackson. And this really the outline. Uh, and this paper is, um, we, we put together a uh, uh, sort of an, an econometric model of looking at political action committee spending and, and Senate roll call voting and try to investigate uh, the correlation between the two. I'm not going to get into all the econometrics, obviously, today and just uh, appeal to more of the um, anecdotal and historical evidence because I think this, this model is rather um, intuitive in its nature and very appealing in that way. And uh, I think a lot of the historical evidence uh, makes a strong case. Um, the, this is a this is a, a public choice um, kind of argument that we're going, that we make here, and uh, uh, you know, voting as a rule in voting models in the public choice literature, on many they've uh, they've often looked at election voting and, and committee voting, um, election voting concentrating on the things that we usually talk about with individuals. You know, uh, we assume that voters are rationally ignorant, and you know that. Um, don't have a lot of incentive to be well informed. Uh, where committee voting has sort of uh, emphasized issues like preference ordering, you know, the, the size of the groups, and agenda control. And what we do is, of course, if we look at politicians in a public choice perspective as just rationally self-interested individuals, just like anyone else. We wanted to look at the question: Is what motivates senator to vote? Right? What are the mo what motivations are there aside from the fact that you know? In serving this position, they're, they're supposed to have an obligation to uh, be contributing to literature. And in particular, what role do PACs play in uh, how often and, and how they vote? Um, voting on the Senate floor, we looked at the Senate in particular just because it is a, a smaller body, um, can occur in three ways. Uh, it can voice uh, what they call division voting, which is standing, and roll call voting. Only roll call voting, though, are actually recorded with individual accountability to the senator. So that's why we concentrated on roll call voting. And uh, what we say, what we argue is that you know senators don't have the same incentives in a voting structure that individuals have. Right? Uh, senators don't want to be um, ignorant of the issues. Right? They want to be aware of what's going on. Their individual vote may count a lot more than you know, the average voter in an election, uh, and also that they vote a lot more frequently than do regular voters. These are all issues that sort of help us to uh, uh, look at this more, look at this aspect than within the idea of committee voting rather than election voting. Um, some of the his history here is in 71, uh, Congress passed the Federal Act Elections Campaign Act, and in 74 they amended it to allow for the existence of PACs. And um, according to a paper by um, Greer and Munger, PACs, ever since they've become legal, their influence has just been growing uh, remarkably. In, there were only 608 PACs in existence in 1974 when, this came in, when they became legal, and uh, their number increased to 1,146 within two years. And as of 1990, there were uh, 4,172 PACs registered with the Federal Election Committee. And so we're talking only... 16 years and sevenfold, you know, increased by seven times. And spending's risen just as quickly uh, from uh, 34.1 million in 1978 to 149.7 million in 1990. Um, now, most of the approaches that have looked at and concentrated on PACs and what impact uh, PACs have on voting and on, on outcomes of the legislature have sort of analyzed, have taken two approaches. Uh, the first approach is to look at PACs and say, well, who do PACs contribute to? You know, what, what explains how PACs contribute, uh, how they make their contributions? And the other sort of standard literature has looked at the idea of, of um, PACs and do they actually have outcomes? Do they actually uh, have an impact on the legislation that's being passed? Can they influence the legislation? And uh, some of the literature has argued for a more general approach, and that's exactly what we do is we take a more general approach here. 
and not looking at seeing whether or not PACs can actually influence the outcome of a vote or a piece of legislation, right? but that PACs in making contributions are really just trying to get access, if you will, to a senator so that they can you know, appeal to them to vote in their favor. Right? So we take a little more of a general approach. They just, they're not necessarily trying to get this outcome in a certain way. They, they at least are trying to get in access and persuade that individual senator to vote in their favor. Um, Anthony Downs, who's uh, obviously the most famous economist to write in this area and one of, and, and one of the first, uh, was the first to suggest that politicians <laughs> are vote maximizers. Right? But that's what they want to do. They want to maximize the votes that they can get um, in, in re-election, right? They want to assure the re-election. And most of the literature that's that's been written in this area has sort of taken that to heart as a, as a premise that you know politicians are vote maximizers. Well, in '89, Glenn Parker wrote a paper suggesting that uh, politicians, are, uh, incumbents, are fairly secure in their feel pretty secure in their seats and are maximizing something other than maybe the votes they can get for the next re-election, and they're maximizing. Uh, perhaps income, prestige, power that goes along with the office, and that uh, no longer is just you know the election itself, the end, but merely a means to an end. And if that's the case, we sort of build on this premise. The idea is that you know uh, politicians that are going to try and maximize the income that they can receive or the rents that they can extract from being in office, uh, subject to just appealing to their constituents enough to stay in office. And uh, so again, elections are no longer an ends in themselves, just merely a means to an end. Well, in addition to this idea, uh, there have been some papers, again, that suggest on how PACs make their contributions. And what they found um, is that you know, PACs are going to make contributions to the senators with the lowest opportunity cost to supply in their vote, right? which which makes perfect sense from a rational standpoint. You're not going to, you know, PACs aren't going to give the big bucks to well-known politicians whose positions are well known. Right? Um, you you your your goal and where you want to try to have the most influence is on is on a senator who has a very low opportunity cost of supplying their vote. There's a th uh, there's a paper by Thomas Stratman where he looks at farm packs and he looks and, and comes up with the idea that it's the senators or it's the uh, members of Congress who, you know, don't have, uh, it's not, it's not the members of, of Congress that have farming as a big industry, you know, in their uh, state that get all the money. And it's not the senators who don't have any farming interests that get the money, but the ones in the middle you know who can who can vote this without upsetting their constituency too much right? that they can vote in favor of these things without necessarily disrupting and upsetting their constituency mm. right. um, so you know so PACs are going to look for senators who have very low opportunity costs of supply in their vote now uh, there have been a lot of things you now voting participation in the Senate has been increasing since the legalization of PACs. And uh, some people have, have made uh, the observation that this increase in, in Senate participation <laughs> is due to the fact that they keep winning elections by very narrow margins, that incumbents are winning elections by very narrow margins. Um, there are uh, sort of two things that sort of call this into question. If you look at over recent years, okay, um, you know, over the last decade or so, uh, incumbents have been being reelected in higher proportions than they were 20, even 40 years ago. Um, and that if, if Senate, uh, voting participation then is really a key to seeing wider margins of victory, right, then if they're voting higher, we should see wider margins of victory, and that hasn't been the case. Uh, rather, we, we suggest that incumbents are going to continue to win by narrow margins. Right, following this, this this idea put out by Parker, that they're willing to expend surplus votes 
in order to get PAC contributions um, so that they can pursue their own ends. Now, some of the trends in voting participation are kind of interesting. Uh, we looked at two periods and a, a period prior to uh, the creation of PACs, particularly in the years 1958 um, and 60, those uh, those two Senates and um, and then 88 and 90. So you've got a very, uh, you know, range here in terms of the number of years have gone by, which sort of allows PACs to mature as an institution so that we, you know, we can see differences in these two periods. And between 1950 and 60, over that decade, uh, the voting participation was pretty constant at about 87 percent. Just It was fairly constant over that period. And in 1975, right, a year after Senate roll call voting, uh, or after uh, PACs became legal, voting participation uh, hit a record high of 91 percent. All right. Um, from 75 to 80, roll call voting never fell below 86 percent and reached in 1990 a record high of 97 percent. OK, so it's been steadily increasing um, since since the legalization of PACs. Is this is, is this is the number of votes that are roll call votes or the number of participation in the this vote? is the participation in the roll call votes mm -hmm. by the senators. So we're saying that 97 percent. Senators are participating in the roll call votes that are occurring. How long is your time series? Since the this last? is just this is just two cross sections. It's we've got third, uh, you know, there's a 30 year lag in between the two cross sections, but we look at two cross sections, essentially sort of two snapshots in time, if you will. Um, now, if you look at just even the number of votes though that are recorded, okay, this is what you're kind of getting that more. Yeah. Um, you know. The number of roll call votes that they have have reached highs of 602, 688, 635 in the years 75, 76, 77. Okay, those were all high, uh, record highs. Um, and if you look over a period of two 20 year periods, or roughly 20 year periods, 47 to 69, um, and 70 to 90, and you compare those, there's only been four occasions where there have been fewer votes. Okay. In the 70 to 90 period than there were in the 47 to um, 69 period. So there ha you know, the number of votes that are occurring has been increasing as well. Um, but is the, is the percentage of voting uh, that is roll call increasing? In other words, are they, is, are they calling for the roll on more as a, more and more votes, or do they, it, they it stopped using these other. It seems to be. It's it's um, you know, it's hard to say for sure. That's part of the problem with this, in that since roll call call votes are the only votes that are officially recorded, um, they they do standing votes and they do voice um, votes, but those aren't. There's no there's no actual record of those other than say an outcome. And if you look up where I got this data, which is out of Congressional Quarterly. And they say, you know, the votes, the number of times that the Senate voted on bills or whatever, they only list the roll call votes. All right. So the impression that we're getting is that they are voting in a, in a roll call fashion more often. All right. You can't, we can't say with 100% certainty, but that's the impression that we're getting. And the idea here is that I think that senators want that individual accountability. They want their presence to be known that they're out there voting. This can kind of go um, both ways. You can look at the situation where uh, if, a is, if a senator is actively participating in roll call votes and PACs realize this, then they may view it as an opportunity to you know, meet with that candidate and make a contribution to them because they know that that, can that, that senator is always there and is usually present at roll call votes. Um, Similarly, once uh, a, a PAC makes a contribution to a senator, they have a lot of incentive to be out on the floor and vote to represent that PAC. Right? So it kind of goes um, both ways. And, uh, you know, it's, um, it's, it's interesting. There's a lot of evidence that suggests that there is a, a lot of um, income and security uh, in the 19, starting in the 1960s. As they made a lot of um, 
changes in laws regarding campaign contributions and stuff and campaign financing that have made it harder for incumbents to be uh, challenged. Um, I think you and I, you had mentioned that the other day, I think, and uh, we were talking about Senate, just the running for election. Actually, it was, okay, it was, but Mark and Bill and um, I were talking about the soft money that comes in and rolls in from the parties and that it's very hard to get money, you know, if you're just a, a candidate coming out of of nowhere, if you're not represented by one of the main two parties, if they've got some sort of soft money flowing in, then incumbents yeah. have a lot of get this soft money. a lot of security, you know, in the, in their elections. Um, you know, it, it, the uh, the idea here is that um, it's very it's very rational for senators to want to participate then in in more roll call voting, so that they can extract these rents, right? So that they can make it, as I said themselves visible to PACs, and so that PACs will want to get access to them and, and make their contributions. Uh, they benefit, in the, so they benefit in rural call voting by being able to extract these rents. And you know, we can't say uh, whether or not this is actually influencing the outcome of elections. We take a m much simpler approach in that. You know, like I said, most of the literature has tried to uh, determine whether or not PACs actually affect the outcome of legislation, and we don't go that far, but we do say that they are it appears that they're definitely voting, uh, they're buying voting participation. Right? They're buying their representative to be out there on the floor making their case and voting you know, in their favor. Um, you know, so what it amounts to is that we see a change then uh, in, in senators in a couple of ways. They have a lot more discretionary power, uh, a lot more discretionary power away from their parties. If we look at the, um, the data from the early periods, political parties played a lot bigger role in how senators voted. They sort of, you know, followed the, the party line a lot more closely. When you get the hacks coming into the picture, they ease off and have a little more discretionary power. They don't have to always follow the party line. Uh, also, again, we don't, you don't see them having to favor their constituency as much. Right. They can expend some of their constituency in order to extract these rents. Um, uh, there's a bunch of interesting issues, I think, that sort of come out with this. Uh, Greg Dempster and Chris Wesley are working on a paper right now that looks at PAC contributions as being a um, – and whether or not that affects how moderate a candidate tries to make themselves appear. And I think there's there's something to be said there that sort of appeals with this is that you know you want to have a low opportunity cost of supplying your boat you want to look very moderate you know you want to look sort of middle of the road you're not a hard line you know you're not going to favor the farmers you're not a hard line you know we need agricultural support and you're not a, we need to get rid of it um, you know we need to get rid of all agricultural support you want to put yourself in the middle so that you can appeal and get these contributions. Um, there was an interesting article in a recent issue of, of Reason Magazine on, on Washington and can Washington change and by Jonathan uh, Rausch. And he makes an interesting point that I think um, appeals, at least uh, sort of implicitly, to the point I'm trying to make here. And uh, if you'll bear with me for a second, I wanted to read something to you. He says... Um, uh, now, the public despises government, and yet it, desi and it desires reforms, at least in principle. Yet there appears, at least at present, to be no path from here to there. Nonsense, since, says grumbling populists. The problem is that Washington isn't listening to the American people. It's too busy with its partisan bickering to get anything done. It's out of touch and gridlock. That's the problem. And he goes on to say, actually, that's not the problem. You know, neither out of touchness nor gridlock is anything like the real problem. To think of Washington's mess in those terms, as most of the public does, is to rush off in the wrong direction. American politics has never been more responsive, indeed, more Copernicus, than it is now. Washington has never been more eager to react to every passing electoral mood. Angry this week about immigrants, wages, gas prices, beef prices, a bomb, a reset of his child molester? You can be sure that a bill will be on the floor of Congress tomorrow, if not sooner. Right. And I think that this idea goes a long way with the argument that I'm trying to make is that, you know, 
senators are very quick to respond. And he goes on to say that it's, it's special interest groups here that, have, that are pushing these things. And so senators are willing to very actively participate and get out on the floor and participate in, the, you know, and, and, and issue legislation and participate in these roll call votes to get the special interest money. Um, that's, that's really about all I have to say on it. And I guess I can open it up for questions. What knowledge? I hate to imply that politicians would be honest, but uh, once a politician gets the money from a particular PAC, does he stay bought? Uh, are there instances where he would get money from both sides? I, I would assume, sure. Um, Bill and I were talking yesterday. It wasn't yesterday, Bill, that um, uh, was it Senate or, or it was in Congress. You said that um, there was a guy who had received money from a particular lobby group, and he was out on the floor, and he was saying that they needed to, uh, um, you know, destroy this bill, that they needed to not vote this way. And one of the one of his fellow congressmen called him on it and said, "Look, I know you got money from them. At least be on, at least you know, be honest enough to represent the people who are paying you." And uh, you know, so yeah, it, it, it does happen. Um, it's kind of like Al Gore, you know, his, uh, he all of a sudden turned into an anti-tobacco crusader. <laughs> but back in '88, he was standing before the tobacco growers, bragging about how he uh, he had cut tobacco and he'd worked in the fields, and his family's got tobacco <laughs> money all these years. It's uh, um, to a certain extent, I think that they will do that when they, if they really think the wind is blowing in the other direction. These guys will suddenly have a midnight conversion. But well, it's just, again, it's this whole idea, like, and I think this is a really interesting paper that Chris and, and Greg are working on, this whole idea of being moderate, yeah. right? And, you know, and, and, um, and again, you know, this idea that you can stay away from, you know, PACs have allowed uh, senators in particular to be able to steer away from the clear party line. You know, Republicans say this and, and Democrats say this, and if you are a Republican, you should vote in this way. You know, what do we see? We see new Democrats and moderate Republicans, you know. Um, uh, and so I think that, that this is a this is sort of fostered, this whole thing. I think the interesting question he may be asking is, given the data set that you have, could you and, and Professor Jackson calculate the half-life of the path <laughs> and, and that would be pretty interesting, I think. We've, we've talked about that a little bit. Um, I don't know... Uh, Exactly. That would call. That would require more of finding out. You know, we used uh, the percentage of PACs, the percentage of money that they received from PACs, mm -hmm. um, out of their whole campaign contributions, to do what you're saying. Would actually, you know, you have to go back and, and disaggregate sort of and find out the particular PACs and find out how they voted on particular issues. It could be done, I think. Well, and, and it's and an interesting I think question. It dovetails nicely with, with the proposition you put forward. Is the more moderate they seem, well, I could just go with the wind, and then I constantly have half money, mm -hmm. reassuring that that half life hasn't expired. So I think it's a really neat problem. Yeah. Well, um, hey, I wanted to, uh, without I didn't want to interrupt Pete at the time, but uh, your uh, inquiry about the number of roll call votes that have been increasing. I know def when I've looked at the voting on the uh, National Level for the Arts, they're definitely increasing. The uh, original 1965 legislation was passed in both houses by just a simple voice vote. Mm -hmm. And then the first roll call vote in the Senate was in 1973. And if you trace the votes, uh, the last few votes, all of them have been roll call votes. And so I know, I mean, I, that has become more of a heightened political yeah. football. So that would probably tend to explain part of it. But just in that in that instance, the the votes have become more. That's like you know that's the impression they gotten in. in uh, one of the referee's comments was if we could discern, you know, our roll call votes being used more than, you know, voice or, or standing. And because all you get is an outcome with a standing vote saying that Congress passed this and they don't say necessarily, how, you know, um, they, don't even, they don't even record who was. Exactly. Voice vote, right? Exactly. And so you've got no way to discern. Uh, you know, what percentage of, of total votes that they that they did were roll call versus others. But the impression is, as you said, that they are increasing. And because they want to be accountable, they want to be visible. Well, when you think about it, though, I mean, when I was at the Libertarian Convention, we had voice votes, division votes, roll call votes, all, you know, all different kinds of votes. But when you think about the Congress nowadays, I don't ever remember seeing them all in the same room to have those kind of votes you know, voice votes or division votes anymore at all. They have to 
ring the buzzer or whatever and tell everybody to, mm-hmm. to come in. I think uh, as long as a quorum's present, the quorum's present, the voice vote will stand. Well, they assume that the, there's a quorum um, present. Am I right in thinking that PAX just resulted from a loophole in, in the law that, uh, that limited individual campaign contributions and contributions by corporations? In those, right? um, the, the, case, uh, the case that it actually comes out of is... Um, uh, is pipe fitters local number uh, 52 versus the United States, and they were uh, <laughs> um, this was a you know a union group that was making contribution that was trying to make a contribution you know to um, uh, politicians and um, you know it got appealed and they said that, and, and uh, the courts came down and said look this is this is perfectly legitimate you know and so. Uh, they um, prior to that, the idea is that uh, you know it, it's not like this didn't happen, but rather uh, prior to this, you know the union money might they, the unions might give the money to their members and say you know look this is our guy you know make these contributions to him that's that's what's been suggested in the literature that you know this sort of made made sub rosa that um, you know from the from the union, I'm going to take money, and I'm going to, you know, y'all are union members. I'm going to give y'all a little bit of money, and you each individually, as individuals, are going to make contributions to the person that uh, we expect to support our legislation. All right. So tax uh, are, are sort of the creation of the legal restrictions to some extent. Anyway, why would a pack cause a re- of these politicians to respond in the way that you describe, whereas? Uh, in the days before campaign limitations on campaign contributions, they didn't. Well, I mean, I think it goes to the ideas of, you know, just the basic sort of um, uh, capture theory of public choice argument. You know, you've got a very narrowly defined group who are receiving the benefits, and it's very clear. You know, if you pass a piece of legislation that this special interest group is going to benefit, you know, and the costs are very widely dispersed, uh, where you know, back before these, you know, special interest groups could get together in this way and make uh, large contributions, they weren't as well defined. Mm -hmm. And so you had to pay more attention to your constituents and, you know, uh, had to be worried about, as you know, Down sort of suggests, as being a vote maximizer, you know, and and making sure that you were satisfying your constituency so that you could stay in office. Um, So, you know, again, this is... um, it's allowed for a lot more discretionary power, but it's what it's gone ahead and done is defined very specifically. If you pass a piece of legislation, who you're going to make happy. You know? um, and uh, uh, in in this article in this in the Reason magazine, um, he goes on to say that uh, you know, everybody you know likes to talk about cutting Washington, and everybody's upset with Washington. You know, it's we need to cut, we need to reform. Just don't cut my benefits. Just don't cut things that are going to influence me. You know, um, you know, ARP is all. You know, would say <laughs> members of ARP would say let's cut government, but let's not touch Social Security. Let's not touch Medicare. Let's not touch. You know, and uh, uh, it's just his point here is that you know. Um, Sounds like a double campaign speech. You, you know, his <laughs> 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 uh, his point is that. No one wants to cut the interest, you know, the, their own special interest groups. They want to cut everybody else's, which is a problem that we've seen for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I noticed in this particular election that PACs tend to also be playing both sides of the fence. And, um, that PAC behavior doesn't involve always just giving to one particular candidate who they think can deliver the goods. But, for example, even some of the most left wing Democrats have been getting business money again this year, where they did in a couple of years ago. Um, and my guess is that you know it's not so much, it's not that these guys are not going to change. I can't all of a sudden imagine Ron Dellums uh, starting to vote uh, um, you know, like Jesse Helms or something. But uh, uh, is there this analysis that you've been making? Is that is this behavior fit with what you're, what you're looking at? Well, I I think it does in the sense that um, only in the sense that like I said, following sort of 
Stratton's argument that you, know, you want to put yourself right there in the middle. And I think it's appealing uh, to politicians to be a Democrat who supports business. You know, it's, you know, Democrats have got this reputation of being anti-business and Republicans have this reputation of being pro-business. And if you are a Democrat right, who is pro-business, you, you can present yourself as sort of a novelty and say, look, you know, um, I've got my Democrat, my Democratic constituents out there, you know, who, who put me here in office and I, I'm a Democrat and I believe all this, but I'm pro-business. And, and there's no, you know, we don't try to determine necessarily if uh, if they do vote the way that uh, you know the PACs give them the money that if you know these these Democrats are going to vote pro business it's just an, uh, it's enough that they are going to at least uh, be participating more in these votes they're not going to be um, absent as much not because they want to uh, they want that visibility and if, if these PACs are paying them, then they are. Uh, Gary Becker, uh, in, um, in his paper on um, competition among pressure groups, suggests that you know PACs are uh, just like anything else. If a politician isn't representing them well, they will get rid of them. You know that they will fire him and, and uh, fire, fire that politician and find someone who can get the job done. You know that's that's. Uh, that's Becker's analysis, and um, it's a, uh, you know, that's the best you can suggest at this point. Well, my guess is, yeah, I mean, we're also kind of looking at uh, some form of uh, extortion. You know? I mean, that's just what you do. If you give Charlie Langell you know, a few thousand dollars with the idea, well, maybe he won't try to put me out of business altogether, or you know, he maybe he won't tax away all my salary or something. Yeah, um, you know, maybe it's not necessarily that he's going to vote pro-business, but maybe he'll vote, it might be a relative concept, you know, he's going to vote, you know, relatively more pro-business. He's not going to say that we need a, you know, huge capital gains tax, <laughs> you know, and uh, um, there's a, an interesting paper um, by Fred McChesney, and uh, I'm trying to... The, the title of it at the moment escapes me. Um, but he talks about rent extraction in this paper and this idea of what he refers to as milker bills, where um, politicians introduce legislation uh, that they know isn't going to pass, but it will cause a scare. You know, it, it'll cause a scare, something, you know, to say, propose, you know, uh, Senate's going to propose. You know, a 15 percent tax in, income tax in, increase, and uh, there's no way it's going to ever make it past the Senate. But it immediately allows senators to get out there and say, you know, I will make sure that this will get defeated. I promise you, this bill will never make it out of the Senate. And it allows them, you know, to to get all kinds of support and contributions. And uh, you know, they know it's not going to, it's not going to make it out of the Senate in the first place. And it's very low, you know, uh, very little effort involved. And it's purely just sort of what he refers to as a rent extraction. It scares them into, um, you know, contributing. One of the <clears throat> biggest examples of that kind of uh, legislation is uh, tax reform. And the tax reform committees are always announcing, you know, their various plans and bills that they're going to introduce and that sort of thing. And, of course, that immediately generates all sorts <laughs> of money flowing into the tax writing committees on mm -hmm. both sides because they want to create... Um, People either want the tax reform to get new deductions or rate changes, or they want to defeat all of those deductions and rate changes. Um, when you saw the uh, the takeover um, of the Republican Congress in '94, uh, you also saw, in conjunction with that, all these new grand and glorious plans to reform the tax code. And so, all these new people controlling these new committees or new people controlling the committees, uh, created this, this new legislation, the money started rolling in in record numbers, and instead of being uh, second fiddle, the Republicans became huge money uh, gainers uh, in the Congress, and none of those bills went anywhere. I mean, they never came up, they were never discussed, it was just, you know. I mean, I think all of us in this room were, you know, almost 100% confident that a flat tax was never going to come about. Uh, but um, 
if you look at how much press and everything else that generated. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that there were, you know, on both sides of it, like you said, politicians that got, you know, lots of contributions to ensure that that never happened, you know, that that never was going to come to be. And I don't think there was any real, ever really any threat of that, you know, that happening. Dick Harvey had a nice piece in the Wall Street Journal, if you can see it, where the pages of the tax code, the number of lobbyists, uh, quite nicely. So, it's, it's a nice little correlation there. I have another question, and it doesn't sound like your, your time series goes back far enough, but it, it's interesting to me to think about the accountability factor. It seems like you have a nice zero one dummy variable you could use with the 17th Amendment. Did there uh, come about more roll calls once senators were being elected by the people? And I think that if you wanted to make an argument or, or see whether or not those roll calls matter, mm -hmm. you might have, and I don't even know when the 17th Amendment passed. 19, yeah, I don't know, 21 Somewhere or something like that. But, you know, it would certainly lend credence to your argument if you see more folks, uh, you know, calling for and having roll calls after the 17th Amendment. That would be an interesting um, thing to look at. There's been, you know, and, and most of the stuff on um, PACs, uh, a lot of it, when it looks at the formation of PACs and just the whole special interest uh, groups, uh, makes note of the 17th Amendment and this idea of trying to get, you know, that there were there were a lot of special interest groups that, you know, pushed for that sure um, you know a lot of local unions and, and and things you know that wanted to get it in the hands of, of the people as opposed to uh, you know their state representatives and they a lot of people point to that as a starting point sure. for this whole trend which has happened over you know mm -hmm. last 70 some odd years you know uh, and, and just sort of keeps keeps going there was a um, you know, but this idea of um, it's a shame John Benson is in here because he's the yeah. As far as the um, you know the formalities of the legal structure, I'm I don't know as well. You know, and it's um uh, you know we picked you know picked the years that we did um, because of being able to you know get the data very nicely and stuff and and. Pick the years that we did because, like I said, there was, uh, you know, in 1958, I'm sure no one anticipated PACs becoming legal. And by 1990, you know, they were well established. And, uh, you know, there was some comment about the fact that maybe we should have a time series here uh, rather than two cross sections. Yeah. But, um, you know, the, the thing is, and this would be an interesting, uh, I think, paper in and of itself. Is if you look at um, uh, Sugar uh, Tolson, their paper on dissemination of um, uh, on, on information, this idea of it becoming you know, over time this process, you know, I don't know that that time series would demonstrate as clearly this trend. I mean, it would, but it, it, it may be a, may not be as obvious as if we look at two snapshots. Um, that, you know, there has to be time for this information to sink in and for this institutional arrangement to sort of take hold and politicians realizing what exactly it is that they can do and, you know, what's out there and available to them. So, so PACs came in in the early 70s, right? Mid-70s, yeah. Mid-70s. Okay, so that must have been, I'm trying to get this straight in my mind, it used to be that you could donate to politicians and it was tax deductible and everybody made individual contributions. And then in 72, they started regulating they had the Federal Elections Commission. And that's yeah, that came out the first 71, I think. Oh, yeah, that must, that must have been when all this PAC thing started. Yeah, it, it started in, um, you know, the Federal Election Campaign Act was passed originally in 71. And, uh, um, and that put a lot of the restrictions, as you said, on, on campaign contributions and accountability of individuals for contributions. And by 74, they had amended it um, because of this case with this, this pipe fitters union who took it in on court that um, so that, you know, special interest groups or political action committees could make contributions as, you know, as a group to politicians. Mm -hmm. Because you, you seem to be arguing with the, the evidence that, you know, with participation and roll call and people being 
you know, held accountable for their voting and all that stuff. It seems almost like you're making an argument that that this is a good thing, that this is uh, improving mm. things in mm. some sense, and there's all this accountability and that kind of stuff. Would you, um, you know, characterize it, it that way? <laughs> anything that makes Washington um, more active, that in my mind, is never a good thing. Um, uh, Dr. Yeager, <laughs> his political uh, economy class, used to always say, you know, you shouldn't vote. It only encourages them. You know, and uh, uh, Bill and I have talked about it at our time, and uh, in other ways, and sort of extended on this and said, uh, you know, um, you know, don't pay them. It only encourages them to vote. You know, um, <laughs> you know. So, uh, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think this is a. And if you look at, if you look at Becker's perspective, you know, Becker and his his theory of competition among pressure groups takes a very, you know, traditional Chicago approach that if we let pressure groups compete among themselves, only the most efficient, you know, packs are going to be the ones left out, uh, going to be the ones that are there. And, um, you know, they are going to be the ones that are a very small number. They can control their members and they can be very influential. And, uh, and, and like he says, you know, they are going to be able to get politicians to represent their interests. And if they're not, they're going to find the politicians that can and he suggests that it is a good thing. Um, it's, you know, it's, I wouldn't, I would never suggest that we need some sort of federal regulation to restrict PACs and how they make their contributions. I don't think that's, you know, in any way, shape or form a solution. It is an institutional arrangement and it has, to, the incentives have to be restructured. How exactly to do that, you know, I'm not sure. Because I wouldn't want to, you know, institute more federal regulation dictating how these contributions can and should be made. Well, we're still funding yeah, which is a proposal. Can you speculate on what would be the consequences of something like that? Let's just, let's just say all elections were financed entirely by public money and, and have it money forbidden. I, I mean, I think that I think it would be I think it'd be amazingly dangerous. I think that you know you've got accountability to almost nobody. Then you know you've got uh, um, you know right now the idea is that you still have at least marginally you have to be accountable to your constituency, and that you know you are accountable to PAC. So you've got uh, you know two constraints there on a politician's behavior right now. Um, I, don't, I think that would almost release the, these constraints altogether, and, and politicians would be able to uh, go with any whim that they saw fit, because there's going to be no uh, consequences for their actions. They're going to get this money, you know, a certain percentage. I think is how it's, uh, you know, been proposed, regardless. And there's going to be little to no uh, consequences of their actions. Further out of third oh, most definitely. I think you know. I think that you know, any time there's any kind of uh, you know, you know, they they want to keep it right now. I mean, that we we see this right now that all the soft money is going to flow to you know, parties are very much want to be in control of the candidates that they have. Impact is a negative impact. It's all on. Um, Third parties, grassroots organizations. That there may be an article on that in that same issue there. I'm not sure of Reason Magazine, where the Federal Elections Commission's overall regulations and reporting requirements, of course, only come down hardest on challengers, independents, third parties, grassroots organizations. Uh, it's the accounting process is very expensive, but also you can. Uh, Sort of stymie your opponent simply by calling the Federal Election Commission and saying, "Hey, he's you know he's doing something wrong. You better check in." And there's a lawsuit, you know, big negative. But the major parties can get around all all of these restrictions. They have lawyers to fill out the forms, and and so it's uh, and also uh, with respect to challengers uh, and independents and, and third parties, uh, the fact that you have to report who is donating money to your campaign. Uh, makes it more difficult to get people to donate money to your campaign. If you're, you know, an abortion rights person or, or some controversial candidate, somebody wants to support you, but they don't want to support you if 
their name is going to be, be reported and made public. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, again, as in most cases, the regulation stymies competition rather than in some way regulating it. And uh, one of the biggest examples of this in terms of keeping people out of the system is the fact that individuals are limited to $1,000. Mm -hmm. Where PACs can basically spend zillions of dollars because they're organized in such a way to disseminate that money. Uh, but individuals are limited to a thousand dollar contribution and even adjusted for inflation, you know, that, that figure should be closer to ten thousand uh, dollars or five thousand dollars. But they've never they've never changed it. So the individual is increasingly getting locked out of the system as the, the role of thousand dollars is dropping. Yeah, thousand dollars is now only worth uh, you know, a couple hundred. So it's uh, you either you either uh, you, you know so it's it's basically uh, there's a big hurdle there once you get it once you decide to run or to start up a grassroots organization you either are nothing or you become a huge special interest group basically. Mm -hmm. Isn't that what economic theory is? So yeah, the regulation that. hurts the new entrants basically, mm -hmm. and that's that's part of what um you know uh, Parker suggests and that that is. Uh, that incumbents feel that much more secure because they've got these kinds of, you know, campaigning, federal uh, you know, campaign contribution restrictions. And has really, that's when he says, that's when he argues, this change primarily occurred. And you see, you know, you've seen this this change in the, uh, the way senators behave in terms of maximi no longer maximizing votes, but maximizing income. I think another paper, if you have not read it, to cite is American um, Policy of the Legislature. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh, that's in an edited volume, isn't it? Or is that, or they have an edited volume? That is included in that. Okay. All fishes legislation. Yeah. I can find the site. No, I I know that one. On uh, it seems logical to me that the most powerful committee chairman would get the most tax. Would that would that be true or um, not true? Well. It's kind of interesting. Uh, we, we looked at committee chairs, and because we're in, we were in, because we looked at the Senate, that's not necessarily the case. Senate, uh, you know, because the Senate is a small, a much more, much smaller number, it's very easy for a senator to get his boy, get on the floor and get their position noted. In the House, on the other hand, I would think we didn't look at the House, but if you looked, at, I think if you did, you'd find that that's the case. We actually included a dummy variable in there with whether or not uh, we we had two variables. One was the number of committees that a politician was on, and the other was a dummy variable to you know to account for whether or not they were a committee chair. And we found that committee chair didn't have any impact. And again, I think the idea is that because the Senate is so small, um, everybody's a chairman. Yeah, you know, you know, everybody's you know everybody can sort of get their voice heard. Where in the Senate or in the House, the ones that you know generally can get the floor and the ones that do have the most impact are the committee chairs. The committees rule the House a lot more than in the Senate. Because I was thinking, if that were true, there'd be tremendous pressure to do away with the seniority rule, wouldn't there? Because um, then there'd be more money just for being a chairman. So today, why should why seniority? Why can't I get it right away so I get all this money? Yeah, uh, yeah. There's um. There's a number of things that would suggest that, you know, seniority rules. Um, you know, we looked at how long uh, a senator had been in office. And that is, the longer you've been in office, the more you know about how the system works and you can, you know, more, better, uh, you can better appeal to individuals. You know how the process works and you know what, exactly what the costs are of, of missing a vote. And um, we found that, yeah, that that's, that's the case. Also, you know, the idea is that uh, the closer you get to being, uh, to retiring, the less you really, you know, the less you care about, uh, the less you may care about making a particular vote. If you miss a vote, oh well, because you're not even, you know, running for office next year. You, you don't even have to worry about your future in that regard. One final uh, speculation here, Pete. Um, the new rule that says you can no longer keep your take it with you, so to speak, or you take your campaign war chest home, uh, 
I guess you get to spend it in some way or another, but uh, you can no longer use it for your personal uh, uses. Um, just one final speculation. Would that have any effect on, on this process that you've been discovering or, or been looking at? Um, no, offhand, I'm, I'm not exactly uh, sure. I think this sort of um, my, my gut instinct is to kind of go along with this and the other thing that I think sort of goes hand in hand with this is, is the idea of term limits. Mm -hmm. And I think in both cases, um, it only heightens the incentives and the institutions, institutional arrangements that are there. And they have all the incentives to, you know, spend more of this money and to, you know, um, it, you know to extract as much rent as they can and as quickly as they can because they've only got a, a, a set amount of time to be there, you know. Um, pillage and plunder, you know, very quickly because you're not going to be able to be there for long. Uh, that That's sort of my gut reaction uh, to that idea. You know, you, you can't take it with you, then you, know, you better, better get it now. Okay, well, thank you very much, Pete. I enjoyed it.